welcome to our talk show this evening on Zoom. Our uh, second good evening. Topic. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, Doctor. Um, well, you know, let me just talk, introduce our second panelist for this evening before we go straight into the topic for the day. Our second panelist for today is uh, Professor Akumbo Mark Anthony, who is a Chancellor of the Christosis University Institute based in uh, Cameroon with satellite institutions in Malawi, Haiti, and USA. He's a professor of social and uh, patristic anthropology. He's a holder of a doctor of theoretical sciences in, in anthropic cosmology from Elio, Evangelist, Elio Evangelical University, Haiti, doctor of theology from Cambridge Theological Seminary, USA, and a PhD in patristic studies from Christosis University Institute. He is the founder and on, excuse me, he is the founder and apostle of Christ Apostolic Commission International. He's also the CEO of Multi Cash Investments Incorporation, a financial and business consulting firm. He's equally the pioneer genius leader and founder of Pan African Freedom Movement, a telepolitical analyst and motivational and conference speaker, just to mention a few. Good evening, Professor Mike Anthony, and welcome to Talk to Africans tonight. Good evening, Blantine, and good evening so, to uh, my today, fellow panelists. Our, our topic uh, for the day is oh, before I continue. Before I continue, I'd love to also introduce my co-host for tonight. Um, thank you so much, Francis, all the way from Uganda from, for joining us. Could you unmute your mic so long? Francis, we, we can't hear you. Your mic is muted. Right. Good evening, Francis, okay, you can hear me now. Okay, we can hear you perfectly. Yes, we can. Yeah, much as I've been listening, the echo from you. I don't know. The, the sound has not been clear. But we can go on like that. Um, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I'm so much privileged uh, to be part of this great team. I'm so much privileged to meet great men of Africa, uh, Dr. Charis, uh, Professor Anthony, and uh, I'm so glad to be part of you, my co-host, uh, Blandine. Yes, um, my name is Francis Bahene Tumwekwasize. Yeah, I'm based in Kampala, Uganda. I'm a journalist by training. And uh, um, I'm right here to help my colleague, Brandin, to see how we can steer this discussion. She has very well introduced the topic. And I'm so glad that uh, I'm part of this team. To discuss the issues concerning Africa. I, I, I'm a proud Africa, and I think for now we can go on, and I'll be chipping in to contribute Thank where you possible. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you tonight with us. And we're just going to talk about the topic for the day. The topic for the day is leadership and governance, its impact towards Africa's emergence and unity. And my very first question goes out uh, to you, Dr. Charles, and I'm just going to go straight to the point because this is this is like a a topic where we have to hit the road while it's still hot. So my very first question to you, do you think that our present African leaders or present African leadership or governance hinders the growth and unity of Africa? Um, sorry, um, I think you are breaking up there. The network is uh, it's actually cutting us. If you can repeat your last uh, sentence there, please. Yeah, um, the, my question to you is, do you think that our present leaders, our present African leaders, hinder the growth of Africa or hinders um, the unity of Africa? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator, and uh, thank you very much for having me uh, this evening to uh, share this uh, wonderful topic. And I think uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in Africa 
and elsewhere, it's the leadership, uh, the lack of understanding what we need to lead. Uh, leadership hasn't been defined very well. Uh, we find uh, many people, especially this side of Southern Africa, now they are addressing themselves or their friends as my leader or my chief. You know, leadership <laughs> has lost its meaning. Um, I'd like to define leadership as an action uh, to uh, lead people, you know, to a certain objective. And uh, uh, an action that uh, somebody has to take a bold decision uh, to unite people to be within uh, what I call a bus, you know, for the destination that has been agreed upon so that uh, you have unity uh, with the people who are in that bus. There's no other people who are saying, I want to go east or I want to go west. Everybody, if they decide that uh, a destination is in the north, everybody must agree to go to that direction. And that's leadership. And uh, if we go back to our first ancestors and uh, forebearers, those who came before us uh, and leading to our independence, you know, in Africa, uh, specifically, you know, they decided uh, uh, on the vision. The vision is where Africa is supposed to go and uh, lead and unite the people, you know. But we find that uh, the leadership which came uh, past the independence, you know, they started celebrating uh, the independence of African independence uh, from the imperialist of colonial masters. And uh, this has uh, lost the meaning for them, or some of them, it's like they have arrived already. And they, we find that uh, uh, the meaning, uh, it is actually meaning. Like uh, my grandfather, Dr. Kenneth K Kaunda, you know, he does not see himself as a liberator, as a freedom fighter, because there is no freedom that he fought for. It has lost actually the meaning because uh, uh, of lack of understanding in terms of the leadership, the role the leaders has to play in a multi-ethnic uh, group uh, in a situation where we have different uh, types of people in society with different uh, types of beliefs and religions and customs. How can we have all these people in one bus and go to the destination that uh, Africa will govern on herself, Africa will uh, treat herself when she's sick, uh, Africa will educate herself on the education that will feed back to the economies, not a, an education that will uh, develop Africa to be subservient uh, to other nations. Uh, leadership is, is so that uh, somebody has to understand as well that uh, how the dynamics uh, uh, operates in terms of political, economical, and uh, social dynamics within the continent. Uh, and as well that we must understand that uh, uh, the levels of leadership also differs from uh, provincial, local, and national government. And as well, uh, leadership, we must understand that there are people uh, whom I call the peddlers, you know, who are above the world. These are, to mention a few, there are 13 families. Uh, from these 13 families, there's also the, uh, uh, the Committee of 300 uh, of Rome, the Committee of Rome of 300. That's where the Pope, uh, John uh, Pope uh, from uh, uh, Rome also is among us to those people. And if you go down the line there, there's also uh, 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 pharmaceutical companies. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, as well as you go down the graph there, among those who sit on the committee of the 13 families, there's Queen Elizabeth, you know, uh, who controls what's supposed to be done in the world. You know, among those, if you go down, uh, there's the United Nations, who's got their own agenda for 75 years, they tabled their agenda that they, this is how they have to rule the world. When you go down there through the United Nations, you have now World Health Organization, uh, where the families of Bill Gates and others, uh, they form part of that uh, uh, control. If you go down a little bit, is the pharmaceutical industries who, who rules the world through the psychiatric industry. You know, when you go lower, there's a tax which, you know, imperialist masters and colonizers that they have to be paid the tax that uh, because they built the African 
uh, infrastructure. When you go down to the middle there, that's when you find our governments of the uh, continent. It can be in Trinidad there, it can be in South Africa, Uganda, uh, Senegal, that's where now the level of the government is. So if you go below the government, their structure, there is a, a corporate, a, um, a private sector. Uh, below the corporate private sector, then that's when you have the ordinary people. So if you look at that graph as a leader, you understand how the dynamics they work. You understand how the world is controlled. As a leader, you are able to take the people uh, through the process that you do not uh, uh, concentrate on the vision because the vision has already been established many years ago. You find that most of the leaders now, they are concentrating on a, on a vision on where Africa is supposed to be. That was decided many, many years ago. Where the leaders of now today they're supposed to be now, it is on the mission. How can they drive that bus to the destination uh, where we want to be? We do not plan to reach the destination now because life or uh, leadership or existence on this earth is a real a, a race. If you find that the duration of governance within the leadership of our political dynamics uh, is uh, paged to five years on average. So as a leader who is elected uh, to preside over the country, your contribution must be within year one and year five and choose specifically what you want to achieve. You know, whether you want to put a tire on this bus or whether you want to install some seats so that people can sit there or whether you want to put lights to the bus so that that bus can continue the journey to the destination is to the place where we want to be. So that is more of a, a leadership and through that leadership, there's infrastructure dynamics which has to be established, you know, which is the governance on how to create uh, systems that will protect us uh, from even abusing our system, that we find ourselves in a situation that we are all working towards uh, the, the fundamental principle of making this bus uh, drivable, that we choose a driver uh, who will take us not to the north or south or east, but to take us to the central destination that we have established. And uh, we get everybody, and uh, talking about everybody, we are from different values, a leader, must have ethics and morals and integrity uh, who performs on the political hygiene and meritocracy. Meritocracy is choosing the best of the best of the leaders uh, who preside despite the polit politics uh, which are within our countries who will unite the people because unity is fundamental for going in the same direction. Imagine being in a bus and everybody is, is not united this one wants to say something, this one because it's democracy, they want to say that. So that is now the average or the definition of leadership and where we need to identify as leaders who preside over a government that we are aware that there are those people who are in higher places who control the world. That's why you see the governments in Africa, they always look up. They always look to the IMF. They always look to the United uh, 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 the the World Bank, you know, to be funded. But how do we let the government uh, start looking to the, its people, you know, to get the funding from its people, empowering to the people so that we cut the umbilical cord from those who are the, the international people are controlling us. So in short, uh, uh, as I conclude the moderator, I'll end there, at least I will outline the structure that uh, we Africans, we must be aware that these are the dynamics of uh, of what has been happening uh, so that we uh, refocus our efforts and our energy instead of focusing on the governments and condemning our governments all the time let's look beyond the governments who is controlling the governments and from that point then we can manage uh, uh, these who control the world thank you very much thank you very much doctor for for that uh, answer to the question and uh, before I get back to you, I'm going to ask my co-host if he has um, any uh, question for either Prof or for Dr. Francis, are you there? Yes, sir. Could you unmute your mic so long? Can you please unmute your mic? It's, we can't hear you. 
Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm trying to struggle with the network. Uh, it's, it's a bit slow, you know. We are living in the in the part of the world where <laughs> sometimes technology comes later. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Doctor Charles. I would like to pick from what where you what you we said concerning the governance. I'm coming uh, back to my region, which is East Africa, and uh, I'm talking through experience. Uh, we, we are looking at uh, unifying Africa, but we have a block called East Africa. This is Africa, the community, the cooperation collapsed uh, in the early 70s. We are looking at today where leaders are trying to revive the community. It, now the revi uh, reviving process started in a decade, two decades back. Now we are wondering what is taking long what is making them take long to harmonize and make this East African community stand again. Before we look at the bigger picture of Africa. Now, uh, in the, as the process is going on, among the leaders, there are some, there's no harmony. As I talk now, I'm um, born at the border of Uganda and, and Rwanda. And I, right now, the borders were closed. No Ugandan is supposed to allowed to cross to, to Rwanda and uh, vice versa. And yet we are in this process and we are really struggling hard to bring back this community, East African community. Now, don't you think that it's leadership because right now the people on the ground don't know the difference between one, what's causing all this between Rwanda and Uganda. It's known between the two leaders. So now, uh, when you talk of governance, what could be the problem and what, how can we uh, in convince these leaders uh, at least this the process goes on and on so basically francis francis is trying to find out uh, a way forward you know because it's a uh, project that have been going on and on and on and we've never found got solutions uh to it right yeah. francis yeah what, yeah if the the, the the director can enlighten me on that so that we can see the big picture beyond the block of East Africa, then later on, the Africa unity. Yeah, no, thank, you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. Um, uh, the, the, the issue there is quite sensitive. Uh, you must remember that uh, uh, during before or uh, just leading to the genocide in Rwanda, um, uh, President uh, Pokagami um, uh, fled to Uganda. And uh, when he fled to Uganda, he was uh, one of the top generals of Yoweli Museven, um, uh, leading to the uh, Ugandan army. And uh, he was told not to leave because uh, uh, President Yoweri Museveni liked Pokigami uh, to be one of these top uh, generals and actually, but uh, to fast forward of what happened, you know, uh, Pokigami had his own his heart in, in Rwanda and uh, in the year um, uh, 1998, uh, 1999, he went back, you know, and he formed the rebel group, which he uh, eventually overtook the government there. The one who was president there, uh, he had no focus of lead, uh, leading the country of Rwanda, you know, to unite the Hutis and the Tutis together because of the just a post uh, genocide. But, uh, you know, Pokigami went in there in the year 2000 as president of Rwanda.
the, the formation of organizations of African unity was based that uh, the presiding officers, those who be the presidents in the continent, uh, who preside over the OAU for a period of time, that uh, after that they will make that uh, OAU as an independent watchdog, you know, who train the governance and governments, you know, within the, uh, the continent and the issue support. But because of the independence and the people celebrated and those leaders, they changed the mandate of the OAU, uh, which eventually in 1995 was changed to African unity or union, rather. You know, uh, and this organization is still being handled by the assembly of heads of states and government. You know, so you cannot be a what a, 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 a a, a coach and a referee and a player at the same time because they adopted the administration of the European Union. If you compare the African region and the European Union, they are completely different because the uh, the European Union, the countries there, they are developed. So they needed that watchdog which is independent, you know. So uh, what is uh, forcing uh, these uh, regional blocks is the finances, you know, because they depend uh, the funding model from these uh, countries. So you cannot uh, be funded uh, by those or those organization or that person whom you want to monitor as a watchdog. That is problem number one. That's why you see that uh, regional blocks, they cannot intervene. The other issue is the agreement which they sign, you know, that um, they will not interfere into the domestic affairs of each and every country, you know. I call uh, these so-called people leave us alone, you know. If you hear about Nigeria, when the Boko Haram started attacking the western or northern part of Nigeria, the, uh, uh, the President Buhari there said, no, leave us alone. It is an internal matter that we're going to handle it. So same what happened in that there is no unity in terms of libertizing the, uh, the, the agenda of OAU, which was formed in 1957, that we are united. And this is the threat from the Western countries that uh, if Africa unites herself, then it will be a threat to, uh, to them because they now will be more attached. And the part of what is happening, uh, we have formed now the uh, Africa 55 states, you know, which will start a uh, world in all the organizations together so that we do not look at funding from the West or anywhere the way we're going to be compromised. Our funding model has to be looked at a, at a, a very good uh, a strategic point so that we, our funding does not get influenced by those who want to attack us. So you must not look at the borders. You know, now we've got social media and other platforms. Continue talking to the people on the other side. One country, Uganda, will never be free if the Rwanda or Nigeria or South Africa or Zambia, they are not free. Look what is happening here in South Africa. Most of the Northern African parts of the countries and Central African countries, they are doing very badly and they are now flooding into uh, South Africa or they are going overseas. So now we must now start talking about unity. And unity, I've mentioned many times that unity is not having one president. It is not gonna happen in Africa. What unity means is the, all the energies that we have the young people and even the older people who've got that wisdom, that we start driving this mission of a bus that we want to go where we can govern ourselves so that we preside over our countries. So this is where that uh, this regional organization, the regional blocks must work together in, in order that uh, uh, have a meaningful uh, contribution to the agenda and the objective what we want. We must remember that we are not discussing a vision in Africa. The vision was set already that we govern ourselves, we preside over ourselves on agriculture, education, and everything. That vision has already been set. What we are working on now is a mission, a car that can take us, and we need a driver of leadership, you know, who will look at what is happening and as well look at the West. If you look at the coup d'etats in Africa, has always been initiated by France. The way coup d'etat uh, came from French. There is no English word or African word called coup d'etat. And Africans, we cannot initiate a coup d'etat because we are loyal to our 
uh, governments. We are very good because of the word Ubuntu. We hold each other together. Because to initiate a coup d'etat, you need to pay all the security forces, you need to pay the armies, you need to pay. It's estimated about $10 billion for you to exercise a coup d'etat. So now because Africans, we lack money, and whoever who comes with money, they put in government. So that is in awe of what's supposed to happen in terms of the unity of Africa. What I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, is let's start communicating of the small things which we have within. Let's forget about the, the boundaries of the, uh, the borders which we have, which are some to divide us. Let us do through the communication and the thing from there we can achieve. We must understand that as people, we are, it is a generational responsibility. So as young people are taking this platform uh, to do this responsibility, we will pass on the baton to another generation who will take over. So our uh, aim now is unity, to make sure that we are talking to each other. We do not have things like xenophobia, we do not have uh, things like calling this one is from Uganda, this is from Cameroon, or this one is from Nigeria, this one is from Zambia, but we must call ourselves as Africans. You know, once we start feeling pain for, for each other, even if that person is not our child, that will be the beginning of unity in Africa. Well, thank you very much, oh, Doctor, for um, answering for answering that question. I'm just going to go straight to you, uh, Professor. We um, I'm queen from what um, the doctor said um, regarding you know um, Africa's strength. He said that the Western society see Africa's unity as a threat. But then my question to you is this: There's this this that usually goes a thief will never have access into your house until you let the door, or until you open them the door so do you think that africans um have a role to play the african leaders especially because since we'll be focusing on the leadership of uh, african leadership do you think that african leadership have a role to play with the situation at hand in africa well well the especially the economic um situation in africa today Okay, thank you, Blandine. To get to answer that question, I want to uh, give a definition for what leadership is in a single word. Leadership is influence. If the word leadership is all about influence. And if I will get to answer your question, I want to begin by making you understand that Africans have never been leading the African countries. Our nations have been led by Europeans for like four to five different centuries today. When they came in here and took some of our brothers and sisters out as slaves, carried them to Europe and to build their own uh, uh, countries and build the entire United States, made it to become what it is today. They came back later on in, 19, in 1884, from December 1884 to February 1885. Prof, I don't mean to interrupt you, but there's a, there's an echo from your side and, and it hinders us, um, we can't hear you properly. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm getting that echo coming from the person who say, yeah, that's true, several times. Yeah, I think it's I think it's the same everywhere. Then. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem with the audio. Anyway, you can you can go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, can I speak now? No. You are so, clear now. You are clear now. Uh, okay. My side. So as I was saying. I indicated that the problem we have in Africa today actually uh, was birthed in Berlin in 1884-1885 when the Caucasians actually sat down and divided Africa into little pieces of uh, nations which they could control. And when they did that, we all know it was for the purpose of looting but what happened after that is that they came up here and pretended that they were giving independence to Africans because a lot of young people fought for the independence of uh, the African nations. 
and in doing everything possible to fight for their independence, the Europe, Europeans who had a master plan in, on how to actually loot Africa and to control the destiny of Africans went further to give them a quasi independence. This quasi independence was just an independence on a piece of paper, but not in reality. So the, the, when they gave these guys the audacity to rule their nations, they went from behind and controlled everything that they were doing. So that's why I said that if leadership is based on the words I use, influence, then it actually implies that uh, Africans have not been on that influential position to actually direct the destiny of their people. They had actually been led and directed by the Europeans. And I want to buy with Dr. Charles the place where we at times get to blame most of these guys sitting in power today, we want to blame them for being weak in leadership, we want to blame them for doing one or two things. But the blame game is not what will solve the problem of the African people. So you ask a question if the problem is not just also coming from us, because at times like you, you are, you are, what you said, you said, you can't, a thief can't actually enter your house without a concern of someone inside the house. That might be true, but they created the people that will be inside the house for them to be able to be in control. They educated them, they gave them education. Somebody can't educate you. Like Gavi, uh, Gavi once said, you can't allow a stranger to educate you. When you give a stranger the opportunity to educate you, he teaches you what he wants. And if he teaches you what he wants, he controls what you think. And if he controls what you think, it means he controls your entire being because the, a man's thoughts determines the actions of his life. Once you are thinking in a particular direction, the results you produce will be what you are thinking. So they formed what we should think. And when they created the thought patterns that we should think, they use the thought patterns now to control our daily activities. So we are actually living in a matrix. We have been programmed to live a particular lifestyle, which we are now living. And the result is the fact that we find it practically difficult to lead ourselves because we have been made to be, we have been automatically created to, to crash. But I want to thank God for the awakening that is taking place right now in Africa where a lot of persons are coming to light of what they need to do in order to become who they are supposed to become. And on that basis, I believe that we need to keep on educating Africans so that they can get to a place where they are able to understand who they are because the actual problem of the African people today is that of identity. We have a lack of, we do not have the right identity of who we are. And as long as you do not have the right identity of who you are, it will just be normal that we should end up living the life from the position in which we are living. We become automated, we led and directed by a different group of people sitting in their countries and telling us what we should do. If you look at things that are happening right now, you just imagine in Cameroon of recent, uh, the, the, the president of my country left and went to France and he actually told, told on international media that he went to France to give report to the president of France concerning what is happening in the country, concerning the national dialogue that happened in Cameroon in September 2019. So that actually was like a shock to many because some people thought he was the one ruling, but they just got to discover that he was not the one ruling. And don't forget, before most of, especially the French-speaking uh, 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 African countries, when they were about to get their independence, there is this uh, particular treaty called the Treaty of Continuation of Colonization, which was uh, imposed on them to sign. And when they signed that, the, 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 the treaty was meant to control their, their education, was meant to control their economy, 
It was meant to control, in fact, every aspect of their life. And if that is what the actual is signed, what do you think that they are leading their countries? No, they are not leading. They are just puppets that have been placed there to actually be controlled by these Europeans in order for them to have their means uh, to, to loot our continent. And today we get to see the infighting from one person to the other. And based on these uh, artificial boundaries that it created, we now see ourselves as divided and we no more see our brothers as our brothers. An African man can find it easy to kill an African man simply because he has a notion that this one is not from my nation. Like what is happening most of the times in South Africa, like what is happening presently in Cameroon, where uh, you, somebody who slaughter his brother or his sister in the name of uh, this is not my brother. Based on colonial boundaries, they get to kill one another. And those are the things that the, 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 the Europeans actually wanted that should happen so that they can look at us as barbarians and tell us that we cannot lead ourselves. We need them to lead us. That is the notion that they want to register. That is the notion that they want to enforce. When we get to think that we are not able to lead ourselves, we need to bring them in. And you know what? That is where they want us to come. And I will, before I land, I want to say something. This is because from every indication, they know that Africa is the hope and the future of the world. They already know that Africa is a hope and the future of the world. So anything that they, they, they can do to get Africa, they are going to do it. Don't forget that in a couple of years from today, let's say from now to 2050, the oh, world... Right. I think we're having um, profits facing technical... Are you getting me? So as I was saying, from just imagine, from now we have just about 30 years, from now to 2050, the population of the world... Right. Um, okay, that, Prof, are you, are you connected? Sorry for that. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's injustice. <laughs> That's injustice. So, <laughs> so, you see, we are living in Africa, and our bandwidth in Africa is very. We 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 do not have the best here in uh, in this, in Central Africa. So we are managing what we have. Anyway, so Peru especially. So as we were saying, as I was saying, I was trying to paint a picture of where the war is getting to in twenty in two, 2050. The population of the world by 2050 would have climbed to about uh, uh, 9 billion persons. And the funny thing is that these 9 billion persons will have a problem of food. And you know, when you look at what the Europeans are doing today, they have destroyed what they call land. Their lands have been destroyed. And when you go to Europe, that is the same thing. The United States, that is the same thing. You go to China. China is cutting down trees and struggling to develop the whole place with infrastructures. And the only place that is still virgin and preserved is Africa. And so they are doing everything possible to make sure Africa remains the way it is so that it can become the food basket for the world. And they want to do everything possible to make us get to a place where we lost that capacity to be able to produce food for ourselves. And that is why they bring the GMOs for us to feed ourselves with. And in, as a result of that, destroying the, what we have, that is for the purpose of taking control. So what I'm simply saying is to make you understand that the world that we live in is being controlled by the Caucasians. And we practically have no leadership in our nations. Those who sit in power are those whom the Europeans want that should sit in power. And when they even sit there, Anytime any one of them struggles to go out of what the Europeans want, they do everything possible to make sure they give a wrong notion of who he is. For example, we remember how Gaddafi did everything possible to bring unity in Africa. And he was killed in the name of, he was a dictator. How many dictators are there? We have the, presently Putin is a dictator. If they if want to take dictatorship from the direction in which they are taking, he has been leading for as many years as possible. We have Europeans who have been leading, ruling their countries or say running their countries for years. 
They do not see that as a problem. But when it comes to Africa, they want to control us. When you look at what you look at what Lumumba did when Lumumba wanted to turn against France, France killed him. When uh, our father, uh, when we go back to look at Kwame Nkrumah, when he wanted to rise up, the sent they killed him. So that is to make you understand. Anyone who thinks that he is struggling to fight against these guys, they do everything possible to silence him, and that is why. They succeeded in the past because there was no means to make our brothers and sisters to know that our leaders are not against us, but the Europeans are the true enemies. So we need to rise together and be able to stand against this enemy that is invisible when we are not seen. We have been targeting our own instead of targeting the right persons. So I think it is time for us to target the right enemy and make sure we deal with them. So I believe that it is time for Africans to rise up. And that is why when we created this platform, we created this platform as a means to actually get to educate Africans so that they should be aware of what is happening. When we created it, we were looking at a time when Africans will be able to get to rise on their feet as one people from everywhere in Africa and speak the same language because of their understanding that they have gotten. And that, I believe we are achieving that result. On a gradual basis, as Dr. Charles rightly said, we need to keep on with what we are doing now. The finger pointing we are doing is one of the problems we have. But we believe that uh, if the youthful generation is going to take position, they need to take the right steps. And that is, first of all, they need to be aware. They need education. When they are educated, they will be able to rise against this uh, colonial system and we will overthrow the colonial system. That, I will come back to you and tell you, uh, Blandine, there is nobody that is actually in the house that is a problem. Those who are in the house were set in the house by those who are outside. So if the thief is coming in, it is because he had placed somebody in the house who opened the door for him. I think I answered your question. Did I answer you, please? Well, thank you very much. Saying by uh, their interest has been paid for them to get there. So, contribute five minutes each. If there's anyone that has anything to say before we go to um, the next part of the talk, and I have coffee. Be fresh. I'd also appreciate it that if we have a con you know who we're talking to, and um, we have coffee fresh, who's indicated for a contribution. You have five minutes. Coffee, can you can you um, unmute your mic and yeah? Yeah. Um, hello. I think um, on leadership, we have uh, two kinds of leaders. We have great leaders and then bad leaders, and that applies uh, generically across the world, and it's not just in Africa. Uh, so we could go beyond Africa and then we could easily pick bad leaders. So we shouldn't really be too hard on ourselves when we look at some bad leaders. Now, the problem we have is where we have the good leaders. Like if we decide to pick uh, somebody like, uh, we, we have names like Kwame Nkrumah and, and some of these great leaders. Unfortunately, although they were great leaders, they were great leaders as, human, as, as persons, as, as an individual, and I think that um, leadership also requires having ability and skill to pick your team very well. Uh, the issue with Kwame Nkrumah was that he was a bit too trusting and therefore his selection of the team resulted in some of his team uh, being manipulated by external forces and therefore that could be a setback. And if you and you can take that methodology across to a football a football game if you've got a manager and you've not got a right team and you, your team is somebody in your team is just messed one, up. i just want to give him one and then from nine o'clock we we'll get back into the sorry hello uh, please go ahead yeah so uh, selection of a team the the, the leadership uh, selecting a, a good leader, some of the problems we've had is selecting a, 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 the, the right team, and we can see that across the board. Now, the pro the team is 
so important that some of ministers or cabinet members and the, 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 the what you've selected could be people who that you want best. You as a good visionary leader feel, no, I don't want to be in power anymore, but still some of your members want you to be in power. And that's not great. So it's important that you have a way that you could pick up your team. Now, one thing I feel uh, that we should, it's important that we should be clear that we shouldn't think of leadership as in uh, the flesh, as a human being. Leadership can be a system. So we should try and move away from, um, although it's difficult, uh, but we should try and move away from uh, the human being as a leader and think of systemic leadership where um, nobody can change that even when uh, Joe blocks or, or, or Kwame goes away or Kofi goes away, Ama goes away. We know that that system is leading it. So anybody who comes in continues riding it. So it makes things easy and nobody can, can shake it. We have depended too much on human beings that it makes it very easy for any external force to manipulate people around that. So we should be, we, we should try and fortify our systems so well. Go back to the drawing board, look at all the structures which are failing and then and fix our system so well that nobody can break that system. Once we fix that system, it's very easy for leaders to come in and just change policies. If you look at the worst, that's what they do. A lot of the time, these four-year, five-year election, what we are doing is wrong. We can't uh, compare ourselves to the four-year, five-year elections. They have already, all these years when they were kings and uh, queens, they were fortifying and building all those structures for a long, long time. Now, all they are doing is tweaking and adjusting their policies for every four or five years. We haven't been able to do that. We have, we, because we were colonized for a long time. Therefore, we are, we, we, we are, we, our systems is such that we are comparing in our electoral system to that of America for five years. No, it's, it's not going to work. We need to build our structures. The vision is there. We need to unite. But most importantly, we need to build and harmonize our structures so well that it enables. We have to look at our constitution. Our constitutions are failing. We have to look and revise our constitution, all the rubbish constitutions which we're given, look at them, put them aside, bend them, redraft them, and then we can appoint people who can lead. That's my right. little contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Coffee. You actually kept to time. Five minutes was your was a given a point of time. So, um, Dr. Charles, I'm going to come to you. He mentioned something about um, great leadership and, and bad leadership. But while I was thinking about it, I noticed that um, we, when we're talking about great leaders, we're only talking about leaders in the past. Does it mean that there's something that, um, you know, I don't know, um, takes over uh, leaders of today that we end up uh, uh, having a uh, 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 complaints and complaints about them, or and we cannot really count. You know, we have only a handful of leaders that we can say, you know, what this is a great leader. What do you think is that that force that boomers and all those leaders in those days? We have a lot of names that we can give up, but today we have just you know a handful of them. You know, what literally what actually leads to that situation, doctor? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, what we need to understand as people, especially in Africa, um, that uh, some of those leaders we celebrate today are the ones who has put us where we are at this stage. Um, we have to admit that uh, they did not do the negotiations, you know, to establish a system that uh, uh, can be established, you know, where whoever the leader is going to be there is going to uh, follow that system. You know, so the, from the beginning, uh, things were wrong. Immediately, a black man uh, met a white man, uh, things were wrong. You know, so, but uh, we're not going to use the credentials for the past. You know, it's quite unfortunate if you can go to your child now and uh, tell your child that uh, uh, you can't afford uh, his or her education uh, because of colonialism or because of imperialist uh, interference in our systems you know i think uh, uh, we need to look beyond that leadership is not something that uh, uh, anybody can be a leader you know uh, you can be a president anybody can be the president 
uh, what is important is the, we have to draw a system, you know, a system which is a structure of the vision that Africa supposed to govern herself. We're supposed to educate ourselves. We're supposed to feed ourselves. We're supposed to make our infrastructure that, uh, 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 you know, that can make easy for us to establish our, ourselves in the, uh, this time of generation, you know. We have to produce our own uh, cars. We have to produce our own elephants. We have to produce our own toothpicks within African continent. We have to produce our own textiles. You know, we have to uh, use all the resources which we have and we must protect uh, the human resources. If you look at America, America has been built on a, on a system that uh, whoever has got a brilliant idea that will become a citizen of America. Uh, some of us here have watched soccer, the last World Cup. You can see that uh, most of the African people, they are uh, uh, playing soccer either in France or Egypt or America or somewhere else. So this is how they steal the people. They offer them so much money. You can become an American citizen immediately when you're a scientist or you can produce nuclear, you can do something. But what is left here, we are left with idiots as citizens who cannot contribute. And uh, even if we change, we do a regime change, we change presidents and presidents, which we do every uh, every time here in Africa, like it is an annual jamboree, you know, where whoever the president is uh, appointed two minutes or one year or six months, is already a bad president. Then we put another president there only to realize that we made a mistake. We start campaigning again. It's the infrastructure system, like what the professors just said, that uh, we need to model an infrastructure system based on the vision that Africa is supposed to be in Cairo. And the, what we are trying to establish, how can we get to Cairo? That is a mission of leadership which is supposed to come now. How can we get into this bus? How can we get everybody into this bus so that we take them to Cairo? the unity of understanding each other, forgetting about the multipartism which has been brought. You must remember very well that uh, after independence, we believed in one party state. Most of the countries in Africa had one party state because there was no reason of multipartism. We had one vision, one agenda, and uh, uh, that's what we were working. And if you listen to Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, it was the same noise in the uh, in Zambia with Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, also in Tanzania with Julius Kambaranja uh, Nyerere, as well in uh, uh, Kenya, uh, you know, Jomo Kenyatta. It was the same language of unity that uh, Africa must go this direction, you know. But because of these whites who's never slept and who's never enjoyed us uh, uh, having independence, they've always been awake, you know. The biggest the problems we have is the traitors within ourselves, you know. Once we establish what we want, then our mission will be easy, you know, and we'll be relying on to that. It's, you know, in fact, I was speaking to somebody on to another platform that uh, we don't mind in Africa having a white person as a president. You know, all what we want is uh, we want that person who can uh, uh, take out the education system, the Bantu education system of teaching people about the grasshopper and uh, who is the president in Nigeria or the United States of America or who is on Habilis, who are the Eskimos, uh, who is the, this, how, how is this, you know. We want uh, an education system that can teach us skills how to produce, you know. It is through production and industrialization of Africa that you create an income for us not to be like consumers. You know, Africa now is a consumer, you know, we always just consume like a grasshopper. Whatever comes, we're just consuming. And the, if we look at the AU, you know, who's been funded the, solely by the international communities and largely 30% of the individual countries, they influence some certain policies which are not very good for us. Uh, for example, the, uh, the, inter, uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement. You know, Africa cannot have a free trade agreement, you know, to allow everybody to come here for free. If you compare the population of Trinidad of 1,3 million people and the population of China, uh, 1.7, uh, 3 billion or 1.4 billion people, uh, China will flood in their uh, merchandise into these countries 
and the uh, textiles from Trinidad who is trying to survive on the 50% profit, they were never going to survive. So you can't have uh, 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 a different in terms of uh, trade and you call it a free trade area. Same with the boxing matches. If you watch a featherweight, you know, there's categories where you can compete. Now, if you create Africa as a free trade area with the United States of America, that's why the economies in Africa are killed completely. The textiles, we can't do anything. Even manufacturing of producing tires in Africa, we can't produce because uh, we have these uh, um, markets or uh, companies which are flooding uh, uh, things uh, from elsewhere. If you look at Africa before the whites, they realize that they're going to stay here in Africa for a very long time. They established the airlines, they established the manufacturing industries. Tires was manufactured in Africa. If you talk about uh, in Southern Africa, we had Dunlop, you know, Dunlop tires were manufactured here. We had airlines, we had textiles, all these, like if you go to Ghana, the textiles of uh, uh, those traditional African outfits were manufactured in Ghana, you know, or if it was manufactured in Democratic Republic of Congo or Zambia or South Africa, that was the attire which we had. But people came here in Africa and said, we don't need this, you must wear the Gucci, you must wear the the Dolce and Cabana, you must wear the Pringle because these African things is not all right, you know, and we changed our culture to start uh, supporting those industries from somewhere in terms of developing and making sure that they take advantage of African stupidity, you know, where now you see the African attire, the Stengers, and the, you know, I don't know what you call them, where you are, but it's the same material, the African material. These are no longer being manufactured in Africa. They are being manufactured in China. The wax, the, the materials, what you wear, the traditional uh, things in West Africa, you know, all of them are manufactured from there. So if we can, can create a model of governance, you know, which would be similar to corporate governance, where we say we are banning all African nations in unity, we are banning toothpicks from being imported from China, how can we forget or how can we fail to manufacture a toothpick? Because even if from China we can manufacture machinery and we've got a lot of resources of people to start weaving those toothpicks. You know, there's something which we can import and something we can say not to it. And the only way we can do that is by having a political will, uh, forgetting about these masters. Some of these things are caused by ourselves. You know, many people have spoken that uh, uh, forget about the snakes which are outside deal with the rat which is inside your house you know when we take out the rat from the house and we throw the rat outside the snakes won't have a chance to come inside you know if you look at minerals very quickly as i'm concluding on that point the minerals are decided in london by the london metal exchange we can't have things like that you know as africans if we study uh, united and we say our coffee or cocoa from West Africa there cannot be imported for $100 a ton. We are asking for $400 a ton, and that will be the decision from the rest of the continent. If you talk about oil in the Nigeria, we we'll say oil should not be exported to uh, Middle East, then it comes back to Africa on the other side, on the excerpt, and we decide like that. And Africa must have an auction for minerals. And we must say no from stealing uh, educated people from Africa because what the structure which has to give the meaning to the institutions. Institutions must have power, not individuals, because individuals can be changed all the time. So once we have the institutions, we draw our own constitutions that will govern us, that will protect us, even from us ourselves from stealing. You must remember that as individuals, as people, uh, we are potential thieves. Ourselves, as we are sitting in this meeting, we are potential thieves. If something is left idle there, we can steal. But how can we protect ourselves from stealing? You know, it's by having institutions that will not lead us into temptation. Even if you are a Christian, if I have to be spiritual about it, you can, the prayer which we, uh, we, we pray all the time is uh, do not lead us into temptations, but deliver us from every temptation. So, so that is the system of Africans that we have to have self-esteem in ourselves. Uh, draw what is immediate. 
our, uh, our immediate thing now to do now, uh, brothers and sisters, is a mission to go to where we want to go. And how do we go that side is what is supposed to be discussed. Our constitutions has to be rewritten. You know, you must remember that all the constitutions in Africa has been adopted. You know, we are very lazy to write. We don't write anything. If you check the law system, uh, we are using the, uh, the Roman Dutch law, which was inherited from Rome. We are using the common law from the British uh, 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 system, which is, it forms part of the civil system and the common law. You know, and our indigenous uh, law, we, it is a fed law of uh, what we use, but we do not use, use it and it hasn't been evolved. You know, so if you talk about African unity, we must forget about who colonized us. The Francophone countries, the 14 African uh, Francophone countries, which are in West Africa and part of East Africa, must come together and unite and say, let's fight these people. You know, if you talk about France, France is the richest economy, having a lot of gold reserves, you know, but France does not have uh, gold mines or anything. All the gold from East Africa and West Africa, they go to France. So how do we look at these as Africans sitting down? You know, African leaders are supposed to be meeting, you know, they only meet when the United Nations has called Africans to go and uh, for a summit, you know, and the, when the professor talked about the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, where Africa was auctioned, Nigeria was sold for 708,000 uh, uh, pounds, you know, because these countries were companies sold by the Niger Delta from the West Africa. If you talk about the Southern Africa here, there was a company called the British South African Company. This is a company which now is Liver Brothers and it's in Nigeria. It sold off the continent to, I mean, the countries to in the Bahrain Conference. So if we look at those with the background, with the leadership of whom we want to be there and take the things which people have said Africa is poor and said because we are not poor, we've got the resources. The direction of Africa will change in a minute. You know, once we decide that we are not poor, in one hour we cancel the importation of things which we do not need here. Because when you import a BMW, you know, you're creating jobs in Germany. When I was in Germany and Europe there, I, I, I even saw there those Europeans that don't even drive uh, the Mercedes Benz or BMWs, they only drive them for special occasions. They drive the Fiat and small cars. But here in Africa, because of the indoctrination, uh, the way our mindset has been damaged, the culture, the way has been damaged, you know, we're still looking to drive there in the car even if you don't have food. But to conclude on that, you know, uh, moderator, is what has happened in China. China, 60 years ago, by Chairman Mao, decided that the culture of imperialism and colonialism has to be relearned from the people. They decided that they're going to do something for themselves. In China, it, uh, they've got a governance presided by seven people. You know, uh, uh, President Xi Jinping, who is the chairperson of the Communist Party, and has got other six people. But if you look at our governance in Africa, in Ghana, there are 143 ministers, you know, presiding over 30 million people. But if you look at China, they've got uh, one mayor is looking after 90 million people in Henan province. So they decided that the Western centric culture, they throw it away. Now they are going through the book. China Mao gave each and every citizen in China a book that they must read that this is what's supposed to be done. And they did it. And this is why you see China that it has developed. You know, China is more, it is even threatened the West, you know, in terms of development. And I think uh, that is where Africa needs to do. Africa must change the culture. We must decolonize our mindset. We must not look elsewhere. We must look within here and recognize our enemies. And I'm sure in 100 years or 50 years from now, Africa will start going into the, into the good uh, direction, you know, by having people and leaders uh, appreciating or understanding that every leader who comes into power must put the building blocks. If you are positioned between the five-year period you're putting four blocks there, you must put the blocks there. Do not damage the foundation and start building again. And Africa has been under construction for a very long time. So it's time that we decide what we want, whether we want to go to Egypt or whether we want to go to Germany, then we must start going through that way. Everybody has to be united.
Thank you very much, Doctor, for, for that. Um, like, uh, if, if I gather from what you said, it's just uh, the change, the times that have changed. And there's a lot of demands and left and right that has led, you know, um, us to say that we have leaders as such. But if we put our minds together and uh, we put our efforts together, we're definitely going to work for a greater Africa. Professor, I have a question for you. And the question is from uh, one of um, our participants who unfortunately is not, um, who, well, but let me, let, me, let me read it out. Can you hear me properly? Because I need to read it out to you. Can you hear me? I'm hearing you. Right. He said, the perceived gap in leadership plaguing Africa is due to failure to create and build leadership skills, knowledge, and prowess. Through institutionalization, what role can non-policymakers whom are not in the political space play to help bridge this gap? Okay, I think uh, from his perspective, he's kind, of, he's kind of right in saying that uh, this gap comes from the fact that uh, there is no institutionalized leadership. You see, uh, earlier we were talking and Kofi made a statement about the systemic leadership, which has for a part, uh, period of time been in total control, which we actually cited that this systemic leadership is something that was brought in. It has been placed there and it is actually controlling the way people do things. And the intention was so that Africans would never have the opportunity to actually rule the lead themselves. And so we are expecting good governance from the people who have been actually uh, raised to be, uh, should I use a very hard word, like terrorists against their own people. And as a result of that, we do not expect them to give us the yield that we expect. So one thing I want to say in coming back to answer that question, if we are going to actually be able to bridge the gap that exists now where the old that are sitting in power uh, have not given the opportunity for those that are coming who are not policymakers to actually have something to say, it is based on the fact that our leadership system is not institutionalized as well as it is not uh yes it's not institutionalized and so if we have to be able to give a voice to the known policy maker to be able to determine what happens in the leadership uh, of our role system of the country we need to get to a place where we go back and rewrite most of our, we need to go back, rewrite most of what we call constitutions, if in case we use them, we need to go back and rewrite them to favor a corporate society. We need to form a corporate society where everybody is a participant. Uh, looking at what is happening right now, I want to say this, Africa, needs to get to the drawing board to redraw what the need that will work for Africa because the African system is completely different from the European system. Africans are a group of people who by virtue of, uh, I, would, I don't want to use the word uh, bad luck, by virtue of uh, situations have gone through a lot of difficulties and their systems have been crumbled because we are not talking as if there were no systems earlier in Africa. There were systems that were working in Africa before the Caucasians came in. And I believe we could go back and borrow from those systems to be able to set up a system that is going to be workable, which will permit everyone to be in a participator in policy making. I want to use this statement to you. The Ubuntu philosophy, which most of us today, we don't even know anything about it, is a philosophy that actually guided our people to lead and to rule themselves and live together where amidst them, 
They never knew anything about poverty. They never lived in lack and scarcity because they believe that one person can be free if the other one is in bondage. So they believe that one person can't be truly uh, rich if the others are in poverty. And that is a system that say, I, am a, I live because you live. I am who I am because of who you are. We can only become who we are if every one of us are actually uh, the keeper of one another. But once we have individuals in the house who are divisive, it becomes practically, practically difficult for us to strive together as a team. And that is because we have abandoned the philosophy that could actually keep the African people on the path to progress. And that philosophy of Ubuntu is a philosophy that determines the value system of the African people as well as uh, is backed by the spirituality of the African people, the African spirituality. You see, some people say African spirituality is a spirituality where African people tend to worship their ancestors, but that is not true. That is a wrong way of interpreting that because we believe that wisdom comes with age. And if wisdom comes with age, we believe in our uh, and the, the ancients, the ones who give us directives, the old ones who give us directives. And if they are good and pass over to the next life, such good persons at times could be consulted not as if they are gods, because we believe in one universal God. The African people believe in one universal God. I'm not saying that there they are not different perspectives of this, but in the midst of it, the spirituality of the African people is a holistic spirituality which combines sociality and spirituality together. It doesn't separate it. And so if there is going to be true leadership, if you go back to ancient Egypt, you discover that they used to consider the leader of the nation as the very incarnate of God, or say the Son of God. He used to be the very incarnate of the Son of God. So they used to believe in what we call divine leadership. Before the Caucasians came to Africa, we used to believe in divine leadership. And these persons who were coming to power, they were having what we used to call uh, their leadership was ancestral, implying that if there is a king from another family, from a family, his children keeps on becoming kings as he passes by. And this never created this egoism, this greed for power that we have today, where individuals want to run and have that. Okay, let's say we have advanced and we need democracy. Yes, it is very important. African democracy is, and I will be sincere with you, good governance is not all about what I'm seeing today. Today, it is all about changing this person and putting the next person. It comes, the system that has been put in place gives the same results. And at the end of the day, we keep complaining and blaming the people who are sitting in power. It is not the problem. They are not the problem. It is the system that is in place that is the problem. And if we cannot change it, we will never be able to work together. So we need to change the system that has been put in place, which is actually carrying us out of the path. We need to go back, visit our past to be able to set the, the pages right so that we can be able to run with what we know best. If we do not do that, we will never be able to give something to this world. I like the fact that Dr. quoted China. China never, even though they were colonized, there was something they did. They never removed the particular leadership structures that they had. They reconstituted it. Today they are calling it communist system. It is what used to be. That was the system that used to be. And if you look at it today, one person has the right to live as long as he has the ability to do it, to be able to set the things correctly. I don't know why in Africa they impose on us and tell us to put, to, to take democracy and the kind of democracy we are talking about here is uh, Western democracy. We can build the African democracy, which has to do 
with what we believe and what we hold. And I believe that there was democracy in Africa and federation in Africa before the Europeans came, where a king used to delegate power to the various uh, sub kings who would rule and sub give power to the headquarters, what is quarter heads in different uh, quarters. And like that, there was federation in Africa and there was democracy in Africa. So we need to visit that again to be able to redefine the path that we are going to take in order to become the Africa we are expecting to see. If we continue with this Caucasian cacophony that we are actually uh, doing right now and thinking that we are running nations, we, will, we are running for self-destruct. We have been put on a path to self-destruct and we are actually doing it with all joy. And I think that that needs to stop if we are going to make a difference. So to, to learn on that point, Blandine, uh, I'll be sincere with you. Africans don't have a problem of systems. The systems are not their own. Africans have a problem of programming. They have been programmed to, to live a kind of life which is not theirs. We need to go back to who we are. And when we go back to who we are, we'll truly be able then to live. And that is why I started earlier when I said that the African people, they have an identity problem. I really mean what I mean when I said the African people have an identity problem. And until that identity is actually identified, located, we'll keep on living this kind of life we are living today. The African people need to go back into them. We need to go back into history. We need to go back into ourselves, relocate what we was successful and be able to apply it. We could innovate it, make it fit with the modern times like the Chinese people did. I like when you go to Japan, Japan is one of the best nations in the world. It is run by an emperor, it's ruled by an emperor. Why is Britain still ruled by a queen? So when you go looking at all these, you come back, ask the question, why did they impose a system of leadership to the African people? I remember, I want to quote something to you, which is on my website. I gave already and put there on the website. When you go to come to Cameroon, there is uh, King uh, Joya, uh, whom, uh, of the Bamun people, who at a particular time in his uh, life around the uh, 19th centuries when he came up to power to lead, he developed his own alphabet to be able to teach his people. And when he started teaching his people under the Germans, when the Germans came, they were not against him because he actually allied with them. And they promoted the idea of him teaching his people in his own alphabet. And so that developed until when the French came. When the French came, they decided to destroy and they actually uh, uh, ban him from using that uh, uh, alphabet to teach his people and to be able to teach his dialect, or say his language to his people and to educate his people based on their culture. They exiled him from his kingdom and gave it to the Apope to run. And you see, as a result of that, the man died when it was not his time. So you discover that the African society had something to do, but look at it. The Europeans don't want us to establish what will work. The highest fear of the European people is our unity. And they know very well if we teach our people our own language, we teach them our culture, we show them what to do, we have a plan for ourselves, we are going to outrun them. And when we do that, it means that they will go back where they actually belong. And so they will do everything possible to put us asunder. They will do everything possible to make sure we are at one another's heels. And that is the problem that we have today in Africa. And as a result of that, we tend to blame one another, but I will be sincere to tell you, the real person and the real system that we need to knock down is the colonial system and the Europeans whom have been putting us asunder. We need to push them out 
if we can do that, that will be the means of success. The Chinese people did it so we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. I remember when Gavi stood up and actually said, if we do not, if others did it, then we can do it. We should educate ourselves with what we know. We should educate ourselves with our own. If you want to teach leadership, we teach the African leadership. We don't bring important leadership and teach our people because when we bring that and teach them, they will still do the same thing that is happening. In our schools today, when they teach you administration, the administration that they are teaching you are outdated administrative principles which are not functional, which they themselves are not using. Why do they teach us that? Uh, uh, doctor quoted the law system which is actually being used today. It was ancient Rome money system. Today, the common law is taught in some parts. We have the civil law, which was the ancient Roman law, which is still being practiced today in Cameroon. It's still being practiced today in the Central African zone. It's still practiced almost everywhere in Africa. The common law in most English-speaking nations. But when you go to, you know what baffles me is that in the Great Britain, or say the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom does not have a constitution that actually guides them. It is the word of the queen that guides the people. They do not have a constitution. And their system is running well. Why is it that we could not look into what is happening there and change and bring our own? Every day we change constitutions in, in Africa because we think that uh, <laughs> the constitutions might be are not favoring us. But we don't need them. We need strong leaders to lead us. We need strong persons with a voice and the authority and the audacity to give us direction. That's not dictatorship. I don't know where that statement came from. The Europeans brought that so as to make us not to believe that we can rule, we can lead ourselves the right way. So we need to work on that. So, uh, moderator, I think that it is time for Africans to get back to visit the drawing board so as to redefine exactly what they want in order to lead themselves to the destination they want to go to. Thank you very much, Professor, for, for that. Uh, I think I'm going to give um, Francis uh, the, the chance to ask his question because he has a question. And then after that, we will also give the chance to other participants who have contributions to make. We have Kwajo who indicated for a contribution. And then we also have Kofi who is coming back for another you know, contribution. But before we get to the Francis, um, can you go ahead with your question? Okay, uh, Francis has been complaining a lot about um, his internet uh, connection. And I think it's at that point that because uh, we are, say, 25 minutes, um, we are barely 25 minutes to the end of the show. So I'm going to give uh, the floor to Kwajo, who can uh, who give us his contribution. Uh, thank you very much and a good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you also to the panelists for the education they are giving us. We are very grateful because they are very helpful. Uh, I have uh, two, I, I took two notes uh, from uh, Dr. Charles comments and I uh, would like to uh, ask this question to him. Um, doctor, you indicated that uh, the the vision has already been set. So leaders, when they come in, they should focus on achieving the mission or what's the agenda for which they have. Uh, so, and in this vision you describe, you put that in perspective of the global leadership. So I want to know this uh, vision, is it something which has been set by the global system order or a vision that our our ourselves or we ourselves have set a vision that we should focus on? Because I have a problem if the global system has already set um, a vision for us or a system that we have to op 
operate within, I am afraid that it will be very difficult for us to operate to our advantage. Um, I don't think that will be very well uh, welcoming. So in, the, in this direction, I want to know which kind of vision or who sets that vision. Uh, secondly, I, you also noted that um, there is the need for the leader or every leader has a, a mandate to help the people help them have one uh, one direction so that some will not say we are going to this direction others going to this direction um if that has become the case and today we are in a system that we said democracy and this western democracy permits the existence of an opposition opposition that need to be paid need to sponsor just to in case to just oppose, I understand that opposition has a responsibility to check and balance the governance system. But uh, in reality, this Western democratic system, the opposition in there, uh, to me, or what I've been witnessing is that this opposition is being paid to just oppose almost everything that uh, our state or government does, whether good or bad. So if this has become the case, uh, do you think that we can maintain this system, this colonial or global system, and still be able to have our leaders be able to have us in unity and move us in one direction? So these are two important questions that I will be glad if you can uh, point out to. Uh, finally, let me comment on uh, the leadership and then uh, this issue of we having uh, strong leaders, strong institution. I, I, sometimes I get confused. Uh, Obama came to Africa, specifically Ghana, and he made mention in Ghana's parliament, he said, Africa needs strong uh, institutions and not strong leaders. And uh, this I, I can't understand because um, I have never seen anywhere in the world where uh, weak leaders are able to build strong institutions. It, it's never happened. Uh, even if you look into the United States, whenever there is an election, they try to put the leaders in, uh, in, in face to face to deliberate and discuss point on point to know who is a strong leader and be able to set the agenda for the country. So if these people come to us and they try to tell us that you need strong institutions and not strong leaders, I wonder because this is what we are teaching our people. I, I, at the University of Ghana, I know a lecturer, a professor, who set question for students to discuss that, yes, indeed, they, we need strong uh, institutions and not strong leaders. I strongly oppose to that view because I don't think that without strong in, uh, leaders, we can have strong institutions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kwajo. And uh, Doctor, the floor is yours. I'm hoping that you heard the questions that Kwajo had um, to ask you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, moderator, and um, thank you, Kwajo. You know, you've actually uh, raised very important uh, questions. And uh, allow me to uh, take you through on the outline. Uh, the vision uh, was set by Africans. Uh, remember the 400 years or 500 years of slavery? Um, we had the agitators of independence you know, in the late 1930s leading to 1940s that Africa must govern herself because of the uh, uh, the slave trade, you know, the Atlantic slave trade, you know, decided when Africans should eat or when Africans should go to sleep, you know. So those uh, agitators of independence, they decided that uh, we must fight these people. And uh, when they got their independence, it started from... Uh, uh, God Coast, where you are there in uh, Ghana in 1957, uh, you know, where even uh, uh, Muse uh, and Kwame Kuruma mentioned that you delay his independence until the rest of the African continent uh, gets independent. You know, that's where the vision was, uh, was, uh, was actually born in, uh, in Ghana. And uh, as well, uh, His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie in uh, 1960, 63 on the 15th of may they signed uh, rectified the treaty that uh, africa will have this vision if you look at the oau um, uh, treaty mandate if you just google it i think it's a pdf document it will show you exactly what was the vision of africa there in 1963. so um 
because of the agenda of 1884 and 1885, the longest conference I've ever had in my life, which took one year to decide where Africa should go. And also that uh, if Africa starts to fight back the globalists, they have to make tactics in the way that uh, they continue with their agenda to use Africans as pawn to do certain dirty work. You know, that was the mission of the globalists. And uh, if we look at uh, what is happening now, uh, because Africa's economical power has been lost. We are only left with the political power uh, to uh, make elections all the time that we uh, decide to remove somebody off from the office. And that political power means nothing if we've lost the economical power. All the presidents in Africa to date has been put in power. So now when I talked about when we started into our meeting that when I talked about these layers of society, uh, the committee of 13 and the, the queen where she sits and the pope where they decide where they must take the money from which country, those are the ones who dictate because they put presidents in power. So if they put you into power, then you'll be answerable not to your people, but you'll be answerable to the uh, those who put you in power because they've supported your campaign. When I decided to run for presidency in my country, Zambia, I was approached by people from uh, uh, Belgium uh, who uh, invited me to meet in Switzerland that they're going to give me $300 million uh, to do the campaign for 2021. Then I must sign some conditions that uh, uh, all the minerals in Zambia and the proceeds, you know, they will be leading this agenda and they, they will be telling me what to do in the country as a president. And if I do not conform with that, it will be breach of, of agreement and they will take me out of power. They told me that straight, you know. I walked out from that meeting and I've never got in touch with them. I refused to sign that agreement that uh, if I become president, I want to listen to the people. I want to do what the people, I want to uplift the people's lives. I want to do the management, I want to build infrastructures. But the way the system of the globalist work dictates what you're supposed to do. For instance, if you look at uh, China, the way it has evolved in the last 60 years, it has become the superpower in Africa. It has been funding infrastructure projects. The United Nations through the World Bank and the uh, IMF, they've been left behind because they haven't been funding any country in the past 15, 20 years. So they, they had a threat. And this COVID pandemic, which has been uh, planned by the globalist uh, uh, um, uh, engineers, you know, who engineered the pandemic, that uh, uh, they, they, they bring this disease to shut down the, the countries so that the countries become uh, desperate and destitute and, the, and they run to the IMF and World Bank to get the loans. You know, this is all has been an idea and an agenda. If you look at the pandemic, what is happening, most African countries now, they are, they, 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 uh, they are down to earth and they are subservient to this globalist agenda because they are answerable to them. If you look at the conditions here in South Africa, they borrowed about uh, $4.3 billion, you know, as a COVID uh, package to stimulate the economy and fight the pandemic, what I call the pandemic, because they planned the, the, the COVID-19. You know, if you look at the, some movies, they've talked about the uh, contagious, it's talked about the COVID pandemic of those who have watched it. It is there. How can they know about the movie before the, 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 the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, they call it, uh, came to be discovered in 2019? You'll find it in the books, even if in 1918, it was the idea that they created the swine flu. They created the HIV and the AIDS that they depopulate the people because the black people, they are making the planet dirty. They came up with the climate change. Climate change has been the idea to depopulate the, the population of the people. This has been an agenda with the globalist of these people who are on top above the government, whom I talked about the pharmaceutical companies, the Bill Gates Foundation, the George uh, uh, Soros from the United States of America. Who are 
been creating that they are coming to uh, uh, to vaccinate Africa. Uh, I mean, Bill Gates was chased out the fact that, you know, polio has never been there in the beginning because these are diseases which has been created to, uh, uh, to confuse uh, the African people. And because we are ignorant and stupid and whatever they bring, they said, no, bring the vaccinations because we haven't evolved as Africans. So these are agendas and visions uh, which has been created by the globalists because the governments are put in place. And when you do not do as a government what you're supposed to happen, they create confusion in the country. Uh, I'll give you very quickly an example of what has happened in Mali. In Mali, the president who was there before 2012 was listening to the France, the French uh, community, including Denmark and United States of America and the United Nations who have been in Mali for a very long time. Uh, after the president he lost his sheen and shine, he started doing to start helping the people. They created the coup d'etat. They hired the mercenaries. If you hear about mercenaries, these are hired and very trained uh, soldiers who can come from everywhere in the world to dispose of the government, to hold the government hostage until that president resigns. They did that for uh, Abu Bakr uh, uh, Kaita. You know, in 2012, in 2013, they put him in power. But when he stopped doing what the masters uh, put him to do, they started creating something that uh, they created a few people from the East uh, Ecowas block and United Nations and a few others to go and sit down with him to uh, create some constitutional amendments that uh, he stays for more than five years into power. So through that, they told him that uh, you are a good president, President Kaita, the people love you, you cannot leave, you know, Ghana, I mean, Mali has never had a president like you. Uh, please, right. we want you to stay longer. Can you change the constitution that you stay longer? So he went in public and bought in there because he said the people wants me. So he went to announce that he's going to change and extend his mandate, you know. And when he announced that, he started creating now an immunity. You know, people started hating him. The opposition political parties, they started hating him that why do you want to change the constitution, says five years? Why you want to stay for okay. more than, longer than that? Um, so, so this is the story of how the globalist has come to use us as Africans. So hence I'm saying that uh, let's look, moderator, I see we are running out of time. We wish we, we had really the running out hours. of time. Yeah, so I <laughs> wish we had so much time that uh, uh, we look in inside ourselves that these conflicts are coming and deposited onto us. Then we we'll start uh, funding our own governments, putting our own presidents in power so that we control them. The, as long as we have the presidents being controlled by the upstairs, we're not going to change anything in Africa. If you if we change the constitution, is not going to be changed. Sorry, sorry. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, I hope I'm invited so again because I want to go on Definitely. and on and on. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying. I was just thinking Actually, to myself. You to know, we need to we need to have you once more on the show, and I'm thinking. Yeah. Definitely, we need to have him come back. Yeah. And um, since we have 10 minutes and we also have questions, so I'm thinking, you know what, uh, uh, we're going to, I think our next our next session, we still have you come back because we have a lot of questions that have come in. And, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. We have 10 minutes left and uh, it's time for uh, Prof. Uh, Prof, we've heard everything that has been said concerning leadership and um, in Africa, leadership and governance. And, you know, we've, we always have you talk at the end of the, of the show to enlighten us a little yeah, bit about... Uh, maybe. If I can also... Uh, I have a general question. Oh. Okay, go Francis. ahead, Francis. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Francis. Yes, sorry, I, I've been having a problem with the internet, but uh, now um, I, I'm, I, I've been listening to all our professors and the doctor has been telling us, now it's like a brain game. Braming the past leaders, we are braming the current leaders. We have uh, scholars who have been writing about the way forward for uh, African unity. Everything has been said, everything has been written. It's like we've not identified the person to come out with this system. 
we are still blaming each other. We are lamenting year in, year out. Who is this person? What is this group of people supposed to implement this? Okay. Um, Prof, I think it's only fair that uh, since you're the one that's doing the closing remarks, you're going to have to take that question, give us an answer to mm -hmm. the question, and then, you know, um, end up for us. Okay, uh, like I rightly said earlier, uh, Francis, it is simple. We have been playing the blame game simply because we do not actually know who is the real problem that we are facing because it is a who problem, not a what problem. It's a who who is behind what is happening. So the happenings in Africa are well-calculated projects that are being executed and once you do not understand them, you get to start blaming the people you are seeing for being the cause. I, I remember when the king, the, the, the president of Chad, uh, got up one time, Idris Deby, when he, he went on international TV and actually told the world that he wanted to resign from power. He didn't want to be a president anymore, but the French people imposed on him that he must be the president and he couldn't fight them so he had to continue being president so he's in power today not because he wants to be in power and that is what is happening with most of the people we are calling dictators today they are not there because they actually want to be there they are there because they are forced to be there okay you go down to africa of rest and look at what happened with uh, uh, watara when the president of africa actually decided that okay i'm going to go off want to go sit home you know what happened? The Europeans, the French people told him, you have to go again. You have to be the president. You have to continue to be the president. Now he's behaving as if it is his agenda. He stands in front of the people and say, yes, the people want me. But they know why they are there. When you go to the present Mali, the situation that is happening in Mali today, you cannot imagine that in Mali, the French people, soldiers are in Mali, the northern section of Mali, not to protect the Malian people, not to fight for the Malian people, but to actually do everything possible to destabilize Mali. Who is to be blamed? Is it supposed to be the president? No, the president was doing his job very well before because of the goal that is in the northern section of, France, of Mali that, that the French people want they sent in their troops, they created some, some jihadists to stand up and start fighting the, 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 the leadership of uh, Keita. And there was a division. They went in and paid uh, uh, what we call today as opposition leaders to rise up against the, 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 the leader. And when you see those are the very effects of, those are the things that are happening all over Africa. When you see today Africans pointing fingers one to another, that is just fulfilling the desire of the Caucasians. But we must go beyond their game. We must learn to step ahead of them and walk further than they think that they are. I think the time has come for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And we must do everything possible to stop blaming one another and rather fortify ourselves, walk to see how we can be the, the strength that one another needs. I have learned that from the Chinese people. The Chinese people decided to separate themselves from the world, build themselves, then they came back, connected to the world, and they have become a war power. I believe Africa has that potency to do that. We are a sleeping giant that if we rise up, the world will bow to us. So that, I think, I've answered the question of Francis. Francis, so do I answer your question? It's no more. Okay, Francis, Francis is having problems with his internet connection, but I'm certain that, uh, yeah, the question has been answered. And I also have Coffee Fresh, who is really, 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 really no, begging we don't have to time. Um, have we, I don't something think that we have time now. So, so but unfortunately, let him, Coffee... Let, 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 let us just conclude it then on Saturday. We can bring in all the discussions that we want to bring and answer all the questions and bring all the proposals and that. I think we don't have time. We should work based on our time. We have four minutes, so 
I think that is true. And God, and God, and God willing, we could have, and God willing, we could have Doctor back with us. So that's that, not uh, a problem. You know, continue <laughs> from where we stopped today. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, so Prof. Uh, the floor, um, coffee fresh Saturday. You definitely be yours. Um, I really apologize for that, uh, Professor. Can you can you go on? Into, okay. Um, you know, the so, for the night. so to 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 conclude, I want to remind us that this platform actually is a platform that is existing on the Pan African Freedom Movement. Well, that is an organization that we set up in order to be able to use as an umbrella to drive our desires and to be able to use it as an opportunity to educate Africans why we are educating Africans on what is supposed to be done. We are also when on walk on the ground with groundwork we have some strategies and plans that we are putting on the ground i don't think it's on social media that will come and announce it to the world but we are actually having some strategies we are putting on the ground we have already put on the ground on how to make sure that we bring our people together and strengthen them economically because when we have the economic power automatically we have political power the one of the effects of the, the problems we have today. One of the reasons why we are living today like beggars in our own continent is because we lack the economic power that is needed. I just heard Dr. Charles talking about what happened to him when he wanted to run and he is still to run for the 2021 election that will take place in his country. But before he, that time came, they had already called him and proposed money to him so that he can sell out his nation. That is what is happening. And for us to be able to overcome that economic weakness that we, most of us, we have, we should build an economic, independent economic system where we can auto-sponsor our situation, our problems. We can auto-sponsor our leaders. We can do what it takes. So we need to do that. So we have put some plans together to do that. And we'll begin to disclose those plans to, to those of you who we are going to call you to go to our website, Pan African Freedom Movement Parfremo is www.parfremo.org. Parfremo is P A F R W E M O V dot O R G. Parfremo, www.parfremo.org. When you go there and register and enlist yourself as a member, we know that you are a member, so we disclose our ideas to you. And as well as we have. Uh, some other projects which we are putting up, we, we believe that you can get to discover them from a website, from, you can discover them through our uh, Facebook page. You can go there, you get to see some of those things. So we are encouraging you to do everything possible to go enlist yourself as a member of this organization. While we have an umbrella, which we are going to work on that. I think we also are having uh, Dr. Charles' uh, organization, Africa 55. I think that's the name, doctor. And we are working in partnership. We are going to be working in partnership to see that we unite our people. So we are going to have more of these uh, kind of projects that we have set up in order to be able to unite our people, uniting them from an economic position will give them the opportunity to stand politically independent because true political independence is only possible with economic independence. So that I think I will not want to take much of your time, do everything possible to be part of the organization. We are doing our best to make sure we educate you. We can, you can also choose to be a sponsor in it because one of the things I'll tell you, like uh, uh, Dr. Riley said, we do not want a situation where people come from outside and sponsor us. When they start doing that, they control our agenda and we don't want people to control our agenda. So we will self-sponsor our organizations so that we will be able to use it to affect our continent rightly. Thank you very much. And I believe that that is where I am. Thank you very much, Bandit. 
Well, thank you very much, Prof, for, for that. And I'm hoping that everyone that has not registered on the website yet, you can remember the, 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 the website address is www.profremove.org. I've written it down for everyone to see. So go to the website, register, and then become part and parcel of this movement that um, you know will bring a change to Africa, Africans in Africa and Africa in Africans in the diaspora. So thank you everyone for participating to talk to Africans tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Doctor, for taking out your time to be with us this evening. And we're hoping that in the nearest future we'll still have some time with you again. It has really been an educative one, inspiring, of course, and uh, definitely we can't wait, you know, to have you once more with us. Thank you so much, Prof for um, also, uh, okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Prof, for also an intense, uh, you know, our educative uh, program. Thank you for having, giving us your time as well. It's actually a privilege um, having uh, this uh, talk with you. Thank you, Kwajo. Thank you so much. I'm not going to forget my co-host, Francis, all the way from Uganda. Thank you so much for, for, for being part of this session today. Thank, thank you. you, Kennedy. Pleasure, thank you, yeah. Kosti. Sasana, thank you, Napo. Thank you, Coffee. Coffee, I, I, I promise you, uh, very next time you would, uh, I'm going to give you your time, you know, to have your contribution. So just keep it in mind, write it down somewhere because uh, we never stop talking. Eh? We always have opportunity to talk, and uh, it doesn't matter if it's something that we spoke about the last week. You're still going to have time to talk about it next week. Thank you so much, Zakele. So we'll be, we'll be uh, hosting. Been a pleasure. We'll be I think on the 8th, we'll be hosting uh, Flo Limumba on our platform here. On the 8th of September, wow. Flo Limumba will be with us here. So we should also be preparing mm. to receive him as he's a good educator for Africa. So good evening to all of you. Yeah. And <laughs> tell someone to tell someone who knows someone to tell someone. <laughs> yes, that's true. We'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it's gonna be it's gonna be huge. Okay. And yeah. It's that note that I'll say good night. To good everyone. night to everyone. Good night to you. Mm. Have a blessed evening. And okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent, yeah. excellent show. Excellent discussion. <laughs> Hope to see Thank Dr. You. Charles back again. RNG nine ten. Good night. Again. We are saying good night, and I believe that we we'll speak night. tomorrow. Good night. Cool. Okay. Good night. Francis. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Professor okay. Blanain. Good night. Okay, thank you. Musa Sana. Good night. Good night to Zakili. All right, folks. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 B